It's not Halloween and it's not Christmas, but on Movies and Me, we don't care about rules. Welcome to a new episode of Movies and Me, and I have a very special guest who I've been wanting to work with for ages, and we finally got him here. He's the host of the Jesus Takes the Real podcast, and you can see him uh, collaborating with the Collider Movie Talk page on Jonathan Youngblood's Collider Chat. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Devon Taylor. What's up, what's up, guys? I am uh, super excited, yes, and finally super excited to work with you. It's like between the time zone and my crazy, ridiculous schedule, like, it's been it's been crazy, but I am super excited to uh, talk my favorite movie with you. Yeah, I was quite surprised that you uh, picked this, but it's one of my favorites, too. You've picked uh, The Nightmare Before Christmas, directed by Tom Selleck and written by Tim Burton. Henry Selleck, Tom Selleck just Not has Tom. a magnificent mustache, oh, but fuck. that would be great. I would love to see his version of Nightmare Before Christmas as well. See, this usually happens when I'm recording live, like I, I'd fuck up somehow. No, uh, that's really funny though. Now I'm just picturing Jack Skellington with a ridiculous mustache. Give us a like if you thought that was funny. <laughs> Alright, so uh, Devon, I gotta know, what is it about Nightmare Before Christmas that makes it your favorite movie of all time? Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny because like, you know, people that know me on the internet, it does seem to be a little bit of a random choice. You know, but it's like people that know me in real life and stuff know how obsessed I am with this movie. Uh, especially, you know, if you come in, if you walk into my room, I mean, I got posters, I have a Jack Skellington painting up in my room, I got a tattoo on my arm of it, I got numerous hats and shirts, like, I, I got the whole 10 yards. And um, it's, a, it's a favorite movie of mine for a few different reasons. Um, you know, there's one, the personal element, which is, I just, I grew up on Tim Burton movies, and... Tim Burton movies always embrace people, um, you know, to embrace the weirdness of you, to be generally you. And that was something I kind of struggled with, like, growing up, like, through school and stuff, because I was always different. I grew up in a predominantly white area, and I'm uh, obviously not very white. So, um, you know, I, I've always kind of been this fish out of water, and it's something I always kind of struggled with. And even throughout high school, I was never really me. Uh, I didn't let people, like, see the real weird sides of me and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I've always been outgoing and such, but definitely not to the degree that I am now. And, uh, you know, but Tim Burton movies, I always felt very comfortable. I felt very at home watching them, and I didn't feel so out of water. I didn't feel so out of place. I didn't feel as weird because, like I said, that's what uh, Tim Burton movies, that's what they're all about. I mean, you go through his entire filmography, that's, like, what a good portion of them are about. But Nightmare for Christmas in uh, particular one, it's super ironic because, I mean, uh, Halloween is my absolute favorite holiday, and I hate Christmas. Like, people know me. I am, uh, I am a big old Ebenezer Scrooge. Like, I hate I, – I do not like Christmas. Bah humbug. But, uh, but Nightmare Before Christmas is, like, my one salvation around Christmas time to where I'm like, okay, I'll celebrate, like, a little bit. So I used to do this thing in December. I'd, I'd see how many times I could watch Nightmare Before Christmas in the month. And um, I've gotten up to some pretty high numbers before. I haven't done it in a while. Maybe I'm going to redo it next year. But uh, yeah, in Night Before Christmas, it's just, it's this cultural phenomenon. I mean, this movie has held up the test of time for 24 years now. Um, and that's where, you know, I start to respect on a technical level as a movie fanatic, um, because stop motion is a art that is, it's slowly dying. I mean, we have Leica Studios putting out a movie every two years or so. But besides that, we don't really get a whole lot of stop motion anymore. Uh, the movie is only an hour and 15 minutes, and it took nearly three years to make. Like, they really were so meticulous with this, and you and it shows. Like, the quality still holds up today with the, um, the claymation figures and all that kind of stuff, the set pieces. And Night Before Christmas, you're just, you're, you're delved into this world. That's what Tim Burton also does really well. He uh, built these crazy, unique worlds, and you're just, you're just immersed Jack Skellington has one of the best character arcs of all time, I think, especially for how short the movie is. The amount of uh, things and character development that they cram into this movie is uh, it's absolutely incredible. And uh, I can recite the whole movie for you, every song. I have the soundtrack. Like, I mean, I've been just obsessed. I can watch this movie literally just over and over and over again. And uh, I appreciate it more as I've gotten older in life, actually. Yeah, I think it is one of those movies that does get better with age. And I found out recently because I know a lot of people get confused when they talk about this movie. They think that because of the style, Tim Burton directed it. But I was looking at some of the stuff for behind the scenes in prep for this episode. 
He uh, came up with the idea for this when he saw Halloween decorations inside a Christmas store, and it just sparked his imagination, and then pitched it to Henry Selick, and then they made this movie. Does that is that that's totally a Tim Burtony thing to do, isn't it? Uh, yeah, one that is totally a Tim Burtony thing, and uh, the reason people, you know, like you said, people get uh, confused because everybody's like, "Why is it Tim Burton's A Nightmare Before Christmas?" It's based on uh, he wrote a poem originally about it, based off of like you said, he saw the Christmas decorations. So he wrote this quick poem about it and then expanded the world that way. Uh, he still wrote the script. He still did all that stuff. And, I mean, he did direct it, but at the same time, the reason Henry Selleck was the director is because Henry Selleck can actually actually does stop motion. He's the one that uh, directed Coraline. And Henry Selleck actually knows how to do stop motion. Tim Burton doesn't know about stop motion. So that's why he brought in uh, Henry Selleck to be the director. But at the same time, this is obviously Tim Burton's brainchild. This is his baby um, you know, aside from Ed Wood, this is, you know, his his biggest, you know, his masterpiece, his most personal film. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. And uh, there's a really interesting part for me with this movie is that it feels kind of like a cultural thing. Like Halloween and Christmas in this movie is presented as two different separate cultures. And the way that some of the people in Halloween Town aren't so happy about Christmas and vice versa for the Christmas Town... That's surprisingly very, it's very real worldy, if you know what I mean. It kind of gives the movie a whole new level. So, did you ever notice that when you were watching it? Because it was the first thing I thought of. Yeah, that's like one of the things that I appreciate more, like getting older. You know, you watch this movie as a kid and you're just in wonderment of the cool songs and the characters and all that kind of stuff. But uh, there's some very mature themes to it. It's about, uh, you know, like I said, you know, you have Jack going through this identity crisis on who he's supposed to be, um, you know, all the things uh, don't matter to him at this moment anymore, and he needs something new. So, I mean, you have that, but then, uh, yeah, also the the cultural divide of just, like, you know, um, it's kind of like when Americans, like, have their own take on Mexican food. You know, Mexican food obviously isn't Mexican food for (laughs) us, you know, in America, like it is for Mexicans. But uh, that's kind of how it would be if, you know, these uh, holiday worlds kind of swapped and we're trying to do the other world's holiday and that's what happens you know jack uh he's fascinated by christmas and he loves the new idea and it's something fresh and new at the same time it's he's making it just like halloween yeah and that's where uh one of the struggles comes in yeah i definitely see i definitely see um the the divide between uh the people of the towns yeah and um a thing i usually do on here is we talk about like a favorite moment in the movie i know you said this is your favorite movie but if you could pick one moment that's your favorite what would you go for I mean, it's, uh, you know, I have so many favorite moments of this movie, but, uh, you know, going with the probably the obvious choices, uh, Jack's Lament is one of the best songs in the Disney catalog, I think. I think um, it's very overlooked as far as, like, um, you know, a signature song, because it is a Disney movie. People also forget that Nightmare Before Christmas is technically a Disney movie. Um, but uh, Jack Slamet, you, you get uh, this incredible musical performance by Danny Elfman. Danny Elfman is obviously one of the best music composers of all time. I mean, he's up there and Danny Elfman does all the singing for Jack. So that makes it very personal, like hearing the lyrics come from the person that actually wrote it, you know, and saying the way that it's supposed to be saying it. It's very theatrical. I've done that song for like a, um, we used to do this thing in high school called Cabaret, where you do either Disney or show tune songs and stuff like that. And you kind of get a little theatrical with it. Um, I absolutely love uh, singing that song it's one of my favorite songs to sing so i did that back in high school i uh, did it in the movie group last year we did a we did a movie wars thing and i was arguing for nightmare before christmas i reenacted the song while showing off all my nightmare before christmas mem- memorabilia um you know jack slamet is a classic you have so many iconic shots during that song you know of him standing on the hill in the moonlight which i think is one of the most beautiful shots in uh, animated movies that there is so i mean I, I gotta go with the obvious choice, which is Jack's lineman, but there's so many incredible moments. I take it that you've dressed as Jack Skellington before for Halloween and Christmas? See, and that's that's a question that everybody asks, and I still haven't yet. Because if if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do a Halloween costume or a cosplay of one of my favorite movie characters ever, like it's gotta be perfect. So every year the idea comes around in my mind and I try to figure out I'm like, ooh, should I do it this year? And it's just like it, it never feels right. So I'm waiting until the year when I just have a perfect reason to do it. I feel like once I move and I live out in L.A. and 
go to some better Halloween parties I've experienced, and you know, maybe that'll be the time to break it out, or for a convention or something, who knows, but I'm, I'm waiting for the perfect time to do it. Yeah, and uh, I've got a favorite scene as well, but uh, it's actually, it's because I saw this movie actually very recently. I didn't get the chance to grow up with it. I had heard about it, but I was never really a huge Burton fan growing up. I mean, I liked Beetlejuice, uh, the first two Batmans and Edward Scissorhands, but around when I was growing up, Alice in Wonderland came out, and that's where a lot of people feel Tim Burton began to lose his stride a bit. But the opening scene of Nightmare Before Christmas confirmed to me this is going to be one hell of a ride because you just have that really catchy song going by showing you what this village is like and it does world building extremely well. So uh, is that song a particular great moment for you? Is there anything you could notice in there since you've probably watched this movie more than I have? Yes, um, you know, you you hit the nail on the head. It's world building. Like I said, uh, Tim Burton did world building uh, in the 90s in general, unlike anybody ever did. You know, uh, all the worlds are very distinct, and um, but this is Halloween, you you nailed it. Is It's the perfect intro, it sets the mood for the movie. Um, you know, you get introduced to characters that you're going to see later, and, you know, uh, you, you feel the passion for these people. It's one of the most baller entrances ever for Jack Skellington as he rises up out of the fountain in slow motion. Um, I don't know how they pulled that off. I don't know if there's like an elevator lift in there or something. But uh, Jack makes this awesome entrance. He's got the witches fawning over him. And that's when you're like, okay, this dude Jack is for real. Like, this guy is the coolest motherfucker in this town. Uh, he, he's the best. And that's when, you know, you're really thrust into the movie. And then, yeah. And uh, it also has an awesome cover version. There's a whole other alternate soundtrack of... Uh, that they did, like, I think they did, like, 10 years ago or so. And it's, like, popular bands doing songs from Nightmare. And Marilyn Manson does a version of This Is Halloween. And it is incredible. That sounds like it would be terrifying to listen to. i got to add that to my Halloween soundtrack. It, 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 oh, it's so good. Like, uh, it's so perfect. It was the perfect pairing. And Marilyn Manson is absolutely sinister singing that song. It's so, it's so awesome. Well, he made Tainted Love sound sinister. So I'd love to hear what he can do with this. Exactly. He's a big fan of the movie. Uh, like Marilyn Manson is a known really big Nightmare Before Christmas fan, so it was awesome him getting to contribute to it. Yeah, and there was one thing I wanted to notice here because it's something that I always look for in a movie like this, and that's a strong female character. And in Nightmare Before Christmas, we have Sally. Where do you stand on Sally's arc within this movie? Um, I, I will, you know, because I, I am a, I do critique movies and stuff, and you know, I don't believe in perfect movies, and even for my favorite movie, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas is not perfect, it's close, but it is not perfect, uh, and I will say one of the weaknesses um, isn't Sally as a character, because she's very interesting, um, Catherine O'Hara does a wonderful job with, uh, voicing Sally, uh, Sally's, uh, Sally's song is amazing, um, so I mean, the performance of Sally and the character of Sally is very interesting, but uh, one of the weaker parts is, is you know, um, they do build Jack and Sally up to be these lovers, to be in love and all that kind of stuff. And that's kind of underdeveloped throughout the film. We do get a few uh, really cute moments. And it's ironic because, like, the tattoo on my arm is of them kissing. So it's like, as I'm saying, it's one of the weakest parts of the movie at the same time. Um, it's kind of a relationship that everybody likes to fantasize about, you know. Um, she she yearns for Jack in the distance, and uh, he's too caught up in himself, though, and that kind of serves his character arc, because throughout the movie, he's too caught up in his his self and this Christmas stuff to realize, you know, how much Sally wants him, and, uh, and then he finally realizes at the end, whenever he stops being so damn selfish, again, like I said, uh, it's a great uh, character arc, so it, it, it is a little bit of a weaker part for me, um, but at the same time, Sally is very interesting, her her uh, design is very awesome. I mean, you've seen uh, many cosplays of Sally's as, as well. So, you know, it, 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 50-50, I guess I'll uh, settle on. Yeah, her, her look is very Bride of Frankenstein-y. Oh, yeah, it's very Bride of Frankenstein. I mean, her dad's name is Dr. Finkelstein, for crying out loud. So, I mean, very uh, blatant homage to Frankenstein with uh, Sally. But at the same time, uh, like I said, Catherine O'Hara's vocal performance is fantastic. Yeah, and speaking of vocal performances, I uh, never knew this before, but uh, we know Chris Sarandon voices as Jack Skellington in the movie, but Danny Elfman actually provides the singing voice, and the reason why yeah. was pretty hilarious. 
because Chris Sarandon said, I'm a terrible singer. So Danny Elfman just ch- yeah. jumps in and takes the rain. Yeah, that's what that's what I was saying uh, during Jack's Lament. Is, um, it, I, I love the choice, though. I think it makes it feel a little bit more personal because, like I said, with Danny Elfman being the one that created all the music for it, like it feels a little bit more personal coming from Danny's voice. And it also makes me think, I'm like, man, I would kind of wish, like I love Jack's talking voice, but I also I'm like, I kind of wish Danny would have just did the, the whole movie. I think that would have been interesting. Yeah, because I know uh, Danny Elfman was in a band before he started doing music compo- compositions, and now he's yep. more known for uh, music composition. But now I want to talk about a part of the movie that I'm not so sure on, but it does give us one of the more scary scenes, and that's the introduction <laughs> of the movie's villain. I don't know uh, what to make of this guy, so... Um, I mean, both... See, Oogie Boogie is interesting, because, I mean, when you really think about it, Jack is the villain of this movie. I was thinking about this the other day, actually. I was like, Jack is almost... He's an anti-hero, kind of, because, I mean, he literally hijacks an entire holiday, kidnaps Santa Claus, and takes it for himself. You know, so, I mean, when you really think about it, Jack is the villain of this movie, but then you have... Boogie Boogie, which is like, because even when you have an anti-hero, you have the person that's even worse, like the real nasty person, and that's Oogie Boogie. Another reason I love this movie so much is uh, the actor that does uh, Oogie Boogie, Ken Page, is from St. Louis, and that's where I'm from. Um, so that's a really, a really cool fun fact that I love to mention about the movie. Um, but I mean, in those two scenes, because we really only get two or three scenes of Oogie Boogie, you get um, kidnap Mr. Sandy Claus, Racy them kidnapping Santa Claus and taking him to Oogie Boogie. And, but then uh, I'm assuming you're talking about Oogie Boogie's song. Um, and it's fantastic. I love that song. It's so a great villain well. song. It's a, it, it's a great villain. He's very creepy. This is one of the darker moments of the movie. I mean, he, he kind of makes like some sexual implications. Like people like to speculate whenever whenever uh, Oogie Boogie like has them all tied up and the music gets all slow and then Santa Claus... It's one of my favorite lines of the movie. Santa Claus is like... What are you gonna do to me? And Oogie Boogie goes, "I'm gonna do the best that I can." And it, it's very creepy. Like I get goosebumps every time he says it because I'm like, "What does he mean? Like, what do you mean you're gonna do the best you can? Best you can at what?" Huh. Uh, so I think it's a, I think it's a very scary scene. And then the showdown between Jack and Oogie Boogie at the end is uh, fantastic as well because you get to see Jack just be a badass and save everybody. And then you have Oogie Boogie kind of like, um, I don't exactly know what happens to him in his death, but it's like he kind of spirals away or something like that. Yeah, he, he was a, he was like this weird demon thing creature that was composed of bugs in a, in a sack. I don't know if the sack was like the haunted part, like the, the sack was haunted and then just filled up with bugs but yeah uh, jack unravels him and all the bugs get smushed and yeah so oogie boogie definitely dies like a pretty graphic death for yeah. as far as animated movies go and it was interesting to me that you said uh jack's well ne- kind of jack's ambition i think you could see as the villain and tim burton does that a lot with a lot of his characters his protagonists are usually very flawed people like you know you got the likes of edward scissorhands and e- even to an extent his take on bruce wayne is very flawed held back do you think that's just like a tim burton thing or that's just you can't imagine jack skellington any other way um it's it's a combination of both it is definitely a tim burton signature he does have these very flawed characters um you know and like you said ambition and that's a a personal connection for me because like you know when you when you describe yourself and people talk about you know their own character flaws um i'd say ambition is one that's a it's a double-edged sword for me you know i'm a gemini so I, I think there's two sides to me about everything. And, uh, you know, when it comes to ambition, like, I'm, I'm a very ambitious person. You see, you know, how much I'm, you know, recording and doing stuff, podcast stuff weekly. And it's just because, you know, I can't stop. And, but at the same time, it's like I let my ambition get a hold of me. It's like there'll be times, like, you know, I don't, like, see anybody because I'm, like, kind of ditching out on plans because I'm like, oh, I got I to gotta do this. And, you know, so it's like at the same time, it's like I, I do let my ambition get a hold of me. And I've always gravitated towards characters um, that are very ambitious, and it's also uh, speaks to my movie sensibilities. Cause like, I love movies that take risks. I love ambitious directors. Cause like, in a movie, even if the movie is not good or doesn't execute very well, I will always respect ambition in a movie. So uh, it so that 
really has a lot of personal connections to me. Um, I love that you, you know, mentioned ambition. Yeah, me and you have that in common. I always like seeing ambition and taking risks in our movies. And oddly enough, a character I could compare Jack to, now that you mention that, is Lou Bloom in Nightcrawler. He's a very ambitious guy, but at the core, he's ultimately an asshole. Yeah, he's very unhinged. Uh, that's a very good comparison. Uh, and that's a character that I love. Uh, yeah, I love ambitious characters. Like, um, I did a I did a paper like back in high school, and we were supposed to compare ourselves to a historical figure, and you use a trait to compare you to them. And I actually did a paper on Julius Caesar. I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I did a whole paper about me and Julius Caesar uh, comparing our ambitions, and I, it was a really interesting paper. Um, I've always liked Julius Caesar for some reason. I don't know why. Okay, well, I think because uh, I think because Caesar was like the Kanye West of uh, Roman times before Kanye West was Kanye West. I've never heard someone compare compare Julius Caesar to Kanye West, so that's a first for this show. My name is Jesus. I mean, so I mean, I take my inspiration from Kanye West. So I mean, I got I got to throw a Kanye reference in there somewhere for this episode. <laughs> okay, uh, and now uh, Devon, I usually end the show with a little surprise thing. I want you to imagine that I have never seen the Nightmare Before Christmas. If you can even imagine that, what do you say to me to get me to watch it immediately? Oh. How much do I get to say? Like one, one statement, one sentence. As long as you need. Um. To I mean, it's actually not that surprising. I've met a lot of people that haven't seen the movie somehow. Like I mean, yeah, it is baffling to me. But especially you even said you just now saw it pretty recently. So like even that was kind of crazy to me. Um. But what I tell people to get people to watch this movie is, if you like a uh, unique, interesting worlds. If you want to be immersed into a world uh, for a brisk 75 minutes, that's always a big selling point for me. Because, like, I know I can sit through two and a half hour movies, no problem, but a lot of other people can't. So you get you get a wonderful character arc, you get these unique world, um, you get fun songs, uh, fun dialogue, you get all this gorgeous uh, stop motion animation, and you get all of this in a brisk hour and 15 minutes. It doesn't take up too much time of your life, and I think everybody needs to experience it, so... Uh, everybody can make an hour and 15 minutes to watch this movie if you have not seen it and uh, see the the cultural phenomenon that is Nightmare Before Christmas. I mean, I think they're single-handedly keeping Hot Topic and Spencer's like in business still. So. <laughs> I think that's a great note to end off on, a Hot Topic reference. Okay, uh, <laughs> so uh, Devon, I want to thank you so much for coming on to this episode. You've been great to talk to. Is uh, there anything that you want to plug uh, while you're here? And where can the good people find you? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm always working on stuff, guys. You can find me, as always, on Twitter at Jesus12. That's where I tweet all my movie thoughts and you see uh, various things I'm working on. Um, but, of course, uh, check out my podcast, Jesus Take the Real. It's a movie podcast talk show of sorts uh, we just we pick a theme and we play games and stuff you are definitely coming on soon oh um, yeah we had to cancel our recording but that is going back up i promise so um definitely check out Jesus take the real at twitter on Jesus tt real and then i'm also a host uh for courts up arts podcast network um i do a show called tba my brain and that's why i'm uh recapping i zombie all season long so check me out over there as well Wow, I, I I absolutely adore your work ethic, man. You never stop working. And for for now, can we uh, can we tell the audience what me and you are going to be doing for Jesus Takes the Real? Because I'm very excited yes, to talk yes, about we it. Yes, can. Oh, I'm super excited for that episode. Uh, we're going to be talking some metal horror movies. Uh, Mr. Nolan Dean picked Scream, which is a fantastic Wes Craven classic. And I'm going to pair it with a recent meta movie, uh, still fairly recent, uh, Cabin in the Woods. Um fantastic i can't wait to compare and contrast those two movies we're gonna have a lot of fun with that one yeah scream's my favorite horror movie of all time for those of you who don't know and uh as always you can follow me at nolan dean 27 and use the hashtag movies and me to continue the conversation next week we'll be talking to the other half of the odd shape panel mr tom bennis who will be talking about a movie that was directed by the forthcoming Star Wars director, Rian Johnson, will be discussing a little noir film called Brick, starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt. So cannot wait to get into that. And if you guys like this episode, hit the subscribe button, and I will see you guys next time.